lust. Amen. Yes, it was. <laughs> I uh, <clears throat> he didn't give me a word till this morning. I struggled all week, Father. Was it it you want me to say? I'm going to tell you a little story before I start here. If it, has anybody had a time in their life where they heard a distinct voice and the quiet of things speak to you and call your name? Mm-hmm. I have numerous times in my life, at least four. They mostly have been in like a female tone and a soft voice. Yesterday, and it was, I was about just about asleep, right at that sleep time. You know, I was just right there, and he distinctly said, "Johnny," just like that. I mean, it was just a loud male voice trying to get my attention. And I struggled going through some stuff. And then I said, I wasn't listening after the fact. I just awoke with that, Johnny. So the word (laughs) came to me a few hours ago. (laughs) Listen. (laughs) What does listen mean? It means to hearken, to give ear, to attend closely with a view to hear. To obey or yield advice, yield to advice. What's he trying to say? What am I needing to listen to? And then he took me into some... Prophecy. Because we haven't been paying attention. We haven't been listening. Have you been listening to the voice? Have you, is he, have you actually been asking for what he wants for you? What he wants you to do? What he wants you to step out and say? Mm-hmm. Well, he took me to Malachi. And I'm going to read this uh, pretty long Part in Malachi, if you don't mind. The, um, he's given me this prophecy to read and to speak. And I'm saying, listen. He's saying, listen. Pay attention. For I am, this is Malachi 3 and 6. For I am Yahweh, I shall not change. And you, O sons of Yaakov, shall not come to an end. From the days of your fathers who have turned aside from my laws and did not guard them, turn back to me, and I shall turn back to you, says Yahweh of hosts. But you said, In what shall we turn back? Would a man rob Elohim? Yet you are robbing me. But you said, in what have we robbed you? In tithe and in offering? You have cursed me with a curse, for you are robbing me, this nation, all of it. Listen. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse and let there be food in my house. And please prove me in this, says Yahweh of hosts. Whether I do not open the windows of the heavens and I shall pour out for you boundless blessings. I shall rebuke the devourer for you so that he does not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor does the vine fall, fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says Yahweh of hosts.
we're not going to go without sustenance. He provides what we need. But, there's a but. He says, your words have been harsh against me, says Yahweh. But you have said what I have spoken against you. You have said it is worthless, is it, or it is worthless to serve Elohim. And what did we gain when we guarded his charge and when we walked as mourners before Yahweh of hosts? It's worthless to serve Elohim. Well, that's what our nation's doing. The one we're living in anyway. It's worthless. Have we not kind of said that as a nation? Mm -hmm. We turn our backs on the creator of all things that supplies all needs. In 3 and 15 it goes on and says, And now we are calling the proud blessed. Not only are they doers of wrongness built up, but they also try Elohim and escape. We're calling the proud blessed. They're doers of wrongness. Our nation has turned their backs against the Creator. And we're going to pay a price if you don't turn. Malachi 3, 16 through 18. Then shall those who fear Yahweh speak to one another, and Yahweh listen and hear, and the book of remembrance be written before him of those who fear Yahweh and those who think upon his name. And they shall be mine, said Yahweh's host, Yahweh of hosts, on the day that I prepare a treasured possession. I shall spare them as a man spares his own son who serves them. Then you shall see the difference between the righteous and the wrong, between those who serve Elohim and those who do not. Amen. <laughs> we will see it. Yes. There'll be a separation. You'll know who is blessed. You know who's following. You know who's not. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. Yes. This was spoken to the church in Ephesus. Revelation 2 and 1 and on. To the messenger of the assembly of Ephesus. Write, he who is holding the seven stars in his right hand, who is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your works, and I know your labor, and your endurance, and that you're able not to bear evil ones, and have tried those who say they are emissaries and are not, and have found them false. There are false emissaries, y'all. Be careful. And you've been bearing up and have endurance and have had labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. But I hold this against you that you left your first love. You left your first love. So remember from where you have fallen and repent. Repent. And do the first works. Or else I shall come to you speedily and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. <laughs> I'm not here for the feel good message. <laughs> That's good. You know, this, this isn't, oh, a feel good message. Repent! <laughs> Mm. Yet this you have that you hate the works of I can't even pronounce that. 
Nicolaitis. Nicolaitis. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Which I also hate. <laughs> Thank you, Father. <laughs> Here it is. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I shall give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Elohim. The tree of life. If you repent. Mm -hmm. Revelation 2 and 10. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. See, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison in order to try you. And you shall have pressure for 10 days. Be trustworthy until death, and I shall give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. He who overcomes shall by no means be harmed by the second death. Save from the second death. Amen. Yes. Repent. Yes. My word should have been repent. <laughs> ah. Revelation 2, 16 and, 7, and 17. <clears throat> I'm getting hoarse. Repent or else I shall come to you speedily and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I shall give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I shall give him a white stone and a stone renewed, name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Hmm. I'm almost done. Hmm. Hmm. Revelation 3, 3 and 19 through 22. As many as I love, I reprove and discipline. So be ardent and repent. Be ardent and repent. Johnny. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I shall come to him and dine with him, and he will be with me. To him who overcomes, I shall give to sit with me at my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. In 3 and 5 and 3 and 6 in Revelation, He who overcomes shall be dressed in white robes. And I shall say by no means blot out his name from the book of life, but I shall confess his name before the Father and before his messengers. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. Do you hear what Yah is asking? Do you hear what he's saying? Do you hear the Spirit speaking to you? Has the Spirit spoken to you? He who has an ear to hear, repent. Revelation 2, 26 through 29. And he who overcomes... And guards my works until the end. To him I'll give authority over the nations. And he shall shepherd them with a rod of iron as a potter's vessel shall be broken into pieces. As I also have received from my father. And I shall give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the assemblies. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father, for waking me up, calling my name, Amen. and telling me to listen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. Sam, would you like the Nord, please, sir?
Let us welcome the sevenfold spirits of Yahweh. That as his word is presented today, that we would embrace it and live it by the power of the Spirit to be able to glorify his name through what we receive today. Thank you, Father, for what you're about to do, what you're about to reveal. Let's welcome the spirits together. We welcome your spirit of Yahweh. We receive your spirit of Yahweh. We welcome your spirit of wisdom. We receive your spirit of wisdom. We welcome your spirit of understanding. We receive your spirit of understanding. We welcome your spirit of counsel. We receive your spirit of counsel. We welcome your spirit of might. We receive your spirit of might. We welcome your spirit of knowledge. We receive your spirit of knowledge. We welcome your spirit of the fear of Yahweh. We receive your spirit of the fear of Yahweh. Almighty Yahweh in the heavens, hallowed be your name forevermore. Let your great name be glorified upon this earth, the entire earth, the earth that you have made, and all that is in it. It's yours, it belongs to you. We, your people, you have called us out, you have made us, you have brought us forth for your own purposes. What a great privilege it is to know that you have called us and that you have cleansed us and you have called us to be your very own. You have set us apart for your purpose. Today, Father, once again, Father, we're able to, to hear the truth of your word. Father, to thank you for Johnny, Father, encouraging us today and Father, telling us, and, and Father, to give us once again the, 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 the warning, Father, about not repenting, Father. And what, what awaits those who do not repent? Father, we're so thankful that we're not caught up in this world system. We thank you that we're able to live separated from that, which we should. And we thank you, Father, that you are guarding us daily. You're, you're always with us, Father, whether we realize it or not, whether we sense your presence or not, we know that you're with us. You're helping us and guarding us continually every day that we live. And Father, today we have the privilege of hearing the truth of your word. As Mary presented today, Father, we pray that, that our hearts will be glad and rejoice in what you show us today. Father, show us everything we need to hear about, Father. Everything we need to learn. Everything we need to be corrected about. Father, your correction shows us that you love us. Father, correct us in any way you see fit. Father, that we might be able to live a glorious life for your holy name. Father, let your will be accomplished today in, this, in the midst of this people. As your word comes forth today, we thank you for all that will be done to it. In Yeshua's name, we help you pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> It's my delight to be with you today. Glad you could come. Let's go to the book of Numbers, Bemidbar, chapter number 16. And we will embark on a study of this very tragic, one could also say unnecessary section of the Torah. This did not have to happen. There are some things that are about to take place that do not have to happen. But they will. I said this before. One thing is for certain. People are people. What do you mean by that? They're going to prove their humanity every chance they get. Are we not still made out of dust? Amen. Amen. So let's go to chapter number 16, read verse number 7. Excuse me. Where am I? One should be 1 through 7. Again, verse 1. And Korah 
Son of Usar, son of Koath, son of Levi, took both Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben. And they rose up before Moshe with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, called ones of the meeting, men of renown or exalted name or great reputation. And they assembled against Moshe and against Aaron and said to them, enough of you. In other words, you've taken on too much. For all the congregation is set apart, all of them. And Yahweh is in their midst. Why do you lift yourselves up above the assembly of Yahweh? Moshe heard and fell on his face and spoke to Korak and all of his company saying, Tomorrow morning Yahweh shall make known who is his and who is set apart and bring him near to him. Let him bring near to him the one whom he chooses. Do this. Take fire holders, Korak and all your company, and put fire in them and put incense in them before Yahweh tomorrow and this shall be the, the one that Yahweh chooses is the set apart one. Enough of you, you sons of Levi. <clears throat> Verse 16. Then Moshe said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your company shall be there before Yahweh, you and they and Aaron. And take each one his fire holder. You shall put incense in it and let each one bring his fire holder before Yahweh, 250 fire holders and you and Aaron, each one with his fire holder, and let each one took his fire holder and put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tent of appointment with Moshe and Aaron. And Korach assembled all the congregation against them at the door of the tent of appointment. Then the esteem of Yahweh appeared to all the congregation. Uh oh. Within 24 hours period of time, they're about. About 15,000 people die. You think, well, 15,000 people out of a few million, that's not that many. Within 24 hours? I guarantee you anywhere in the world that such an event would take place that within one day's time that 15,000 people died, they'd be all over the news. One would think. The wrath of Elohim has been terribly displayed <coughs> with Moshe and Aaron falling on their faces to intercede in Israel's behalf multiple times. Within three chapters, Several times they're falling on their face and crying out and saying, Oh, Yah, please, please, please. Yah has twice in this time frame threatened to kill the entire nation and start all over with Moshe. Twice in one day. So what in the world has happened and why did all of this get started? At the root of this fiasco lies pride, family disputes, jealousy, and slander all wrapped up in an outright blatant rebellion. There are envy and hurt feelings that could be blamed, mistrust and leadership and anger about a decreed judgment fit in this picture, in other words, there has been an explosive recipe of emotions and mindsets brewing in the camp for an extended period of time. It's an amazing thing that in leadership, you just get the sense something's cooking on the stove. You can smell it. You can sense it. You can be in prayer, praying for your congregation, praying for your people, praying for whatever the situation is. And all of a sudden, this ill feeling starts sweeping up over your shoulder blades and you realize something ain't right. And you know who knows it before the pastor 
knows it? His wife. His wife will say, so I ain't right. I, I, I wish I had a dollar for every time that Laura's looked at me and said, something ain't right. I'd be a wealthy man. <laughs> People had been talking. Two things are certain. People are people. Number two, people are going to talk. Absolutely. There have been whispers around campfires and meetings among conspirators. Moshe and Aaron may not have been aware, but Yah has heard every word and he has known every heart. And when there is conspiratory speaking, whispering, maneuvering, suggesting, plotting, Yah starts stirring that pot until it boils over. Because <clears throat> that's his way of exposing what's wrong. You cannot sweep this stuff under the rug. It happens in congregations. It happens in families. It happens in politics. It happens in national uh, events and so forth. When, as Johnny was talking a while ago, when a nation turns their back on Yah, he will stir that nation's pot until their stuff starts spilling out, playing for everybody to be seen. Amen. When people imagine that their interpretation of things matter more than the revealed word of Yah, did you hear what I just said? You have his word, you have his decree, and in opposition and in variance against it, people start acknowledging the value of their feelings more than what he has said. They then enter into a place of spiritual insanity. That's true. When feelings are more important than facts, your decisions will lose credibility. When numbers of followers encourage the goals of pride and envy, a faulty foundation then is laid that no building can be trusted on. And such, such circumstances among his people, Yah will intervene. He'll pull back the protective curtains and expose the place where all the lives have been sown. He will sweep his floor, gather the dust of arrogant flesh, and expel it out of his house. We've had the grandkids this week, and a couple of times Gavin's just voluntarily gone to the closet and got out the broom and dustpan. For whatever reason, he likes to sweep. <laughs> and vacuum so I mean he'll sweep it up put it in the dustpan now if you looked at the dustpan and just went Pfft, you know that doesn't work no you throw it in the trash when Yah sweeps his floor he's not just going to scatter it to the wind no he expels it out of his house when the wrath of Elohim is displayed who can stand only those who stand on his word. Only those who are standing in truth. Truth. The truth. The only truth which Yah alone has declared is the firm foundation that will endure all a man's attempts to dismantle it. Intelligentsia. Don't you just love I feel intelligent just saying such a word. Intelligentsia. <laughs> Academics have tried to disprove this word. So it's antiquated, it's out of date, or it, it's been proven wrong or in error or faulty in its translations, etc. But it still stands. Scientists say, ah, it's not true. But in the end, this book will prove yeah. true yeah. and science will have to allow for that. It is a strong tower that the righteous enter into and are saved from fiery accusational errors. 
Truth may be challenged, but it will never be conquered. So you and I need to decide here and now whether we're going to follow the crowds of change, seeking to reset the values of the kingdom and further the cause of man, or whether we're going to stand among the few but set apart ones. Trusting that what Yah has proven to us will also stand in the end. When it's all said and done, what do you want? What he says or what man is looking for? Oh, Father, save us from the plans of man. Save us. So in dealing with this, this thing, this series of events, there's three things I want to talk about. The root, the resolve, or excuse me, the root, the ritual, and the resolve. In order for things to start to be healed or restored, you've got to expose the root of it. Don't you just love it when you go to the doctor, you tell him what you're experiencing, and he will treat your symptoms, and you think, don't you want to do another test or something to find out why? My head hurts, my nose runs, and my ears are falling down. Can you tell me why all this is happening? No, let's just treat your symptoms. If you treat the root, the symptoms will go away. That's right. That's right. Amen? Amen? When Adam and Haba took of the fruit of the wrong tree, it was not because, it did say that they, they saw it look good, but that's not the initial appeal to them. They started down that track of taking this fruit because the accuser exploited a flaw in their thinking. The root was a suggestion that Yah was holding out on them and had made empty threats. And the day you eat that, you're going to die. Would Hasatan say, you shall certainly not die. He spoke as of someone who had secret knowledge or behind the scenes awareness. Uh, y'all, I, I was here before y'all. I, I know stuff. Don't you just love those folks? I know stuff. You shall certainly not die. That's not, is that not the same thing as he loves you too much to judge you? That's part of the current gospel that is being preached. He loves you too much to judge you. You're not going to die. The other part of it, he's holding out the information that can advance you to a higher level. The way that's presented now is he only wants to bless you. <clears throat> Come get your blessing. Let me tell you the three steps, the four steps, the ten steps, how many steps to get your blessing. And then he says, there is secret wisdom if you will look for it. It's in that fruit. Do what he said not to do. He's trying to hold something out. It's secret knowledge in that. That can be currently translated as the Holy Spirit told me or an angel told me. Be careful when people come to you and say, an angel appeared to me and told me. Sometimes it comes out with someone walking up to you and says, thus says the Lord. Sometimes they're accurate. Weigh those words. Pray over those words. Take those words to the book. If it's out of the blue, it's not anything that you've never heard before. If it's not a confirmation that something that's already been spoken to you or you feel led to, to understand, chances are it's not him. In the book of Yochanan, John chapter 8, and verse 44, Yeshua said this, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you wish to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, mm -hmm. has not stood in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks the lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So when these voices began to speak to us, encouraging us along a path that's contrary to his word, 
Why are we listening? Why bother to argue? Grandchildren have a way of looking at you after you have made a decree. We are not doing this. We're going to do that. No, we're not staying up to 11 o'clock and watching movies. We're going to bed. Hallelujah for bedtime. <laughs> Just five more minutes. I need a snack. I need a drink of water. Can we just watch the one more part of it? Just one more, just one more. No. If they ever figure out that if you argue, if they argue with you, you will relent and give in. The battle is on. It's when you look at them and say, what did I say? Go to bed. Then why are you still standing here? Go to bed. I don't want to make them mad. Go to bed. Go to bed. Go to bed. Happy, glad, or mad, sad, whatever. Just go to bed. Yes, sir. If Hasatan knows that you will stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and argue the point with him, he will keep up the argument until you relent. When it comes to fornication, you know what the word says? Flip. Flip. Don't stand and argue. Don't stand and look. Don't stand and reason and think about it. Get out of dive. Run. Get away from it. Get away from it. The day of terror that we read about started with a disgruntled family history. Dathan and Aviram were the great-grandsons of Reuven or Reuven who was displaced in his family leadership position by Yehuda not the next in line or even the next in line but the fourth in line Yehuda was the natural born leader of the family he became the leader but it wasn't because Reuven was overlooked Reuben was given the opportunity to lead and he, poor, he proved himself to be a poor candidate. The prophecy that his own father gave to him is, you are unstable as water. Water. Constantly moving, constantly changing, constantly waving, constantly. You can't stand on water unless you're Yeshua. You're unsuitable, son. Daddy, I'll take Benjamin down to Mitzrayim, and if I don't bring you back, you can kill my two sons. Okay, I lose a son and two grandsons because of your faulty leadership. How does that make me feel better? So evidently, the lineage of Reuben had been chafing under this move for generations. Four generations later, they're still angry about this. Korak, he is Korak ben Yeshar ben Koath ben Levi. He is the first cousin of Moshe and Aaron. Did they know each other? Yes. They're first cousins. The lineage of Koath let me write this down because it may help to see this. His sons were Amram, the eldest, Yitshar, Hebron, and Uzael. The two sons of Amram were the eldest, Aaron. And Moshe, the eldest son of the next oldest son of Koath, was Korah. The middle son of the youngest son of Koath was Elitzaphan. 
when it came time to choose who was going to be the prince or the tribal leader of the tribe of Levi. Aaron and Moshe are already significantly placed in Israel. The next guy, but in the hierarchy of things coming down the line, is Korah. It's probable that Korah thought, I'm the obvious choice. I'm the next oldest of the next oldest. It should fall to me that I am the prince. It didn't happen that way. Yah chose Elizaphan, a middle son of the youngest of Koa's sons. Out of the blue, out of nowhere, out of the bottom of the pack. But what does Yah say through Yeshua? The last will be first and the first will be last. Yah does not always choose according to what we think. What did he tell uh, Samuel, don't look at their face. Don't look at their statue. You look on the outside. I look on the heart. So these men might have believed themselves to be demoted or defrauded or cheated or displaced. And what happens when you don't get what you believe is rightfully yours? You get mad. You get resentful. You get your feelings hurt. You get filled with pride. That should have been mine. And all of this is a recipe for a disastrous system of choices. Never make a significant choice when you're mad. Don't make choices based on your pride. Well, this is what I deserve. I bought what I thought I deserved and it took me a long time to pay for it. Not a wise choice. In Psalms chapter 106, verse 16 through 18, this is what we read concerning these same men. And they were jealous of Moshe in the camp of Aaron, the set apart one of Yahweh. Then the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and covered the company of Abiram, and a fire burned in their company. A flame consumed the wrong. What does the word say about those who have an agenda of self promotion? They will seek their allies in their cause in order to ensure that their plans go according to their desires and inflate their ego. Go with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter number six. <coughs> Proverbs, chapter six. Let's start reading with verse 12. A man of Belial, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth, winks with his eyes, shuffles his feet, points with his fingers. Perverseness is in his heart, plotting evil at all times. He sends out strife. Therefore, his calamity comes suddenly. Instantly, he is broken, and there is no healing. These six matters Yahweh hates. And seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. John, you read this last week. A proud look. A lying tongue. Hands shedding innocent blood. A heart devising wicked schemes. Feet quick to run to evil. A false witness breathing out lies. And one who causes strife among brothers. Let's go to chapter number 18 of the book of Proverbs. Verse 6 through 8. A fool's lips enter into strife and his mouth call for blows. A fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are the snare of his life. The words of a slanderer are like delicacies and they go down in the inner parts of the heart. Chapter 19, verse 1 through 5. 
Better is the poor walking in his integrity than one of perverse lips who is a fool. Also desire without knowledge is not good, and he who hurries with his feet sins. The foolishness of a man perverts his way. Boy, ain't that true? The foolishness of a man perverts his way, and his heart is wroth against Yahweh. Wealth adds many friends, but the poor is separated from his friend. A false witness does not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies does not escape. You may wonder, well, how long is it going to take for that to come to pass? It'll happen. It'll happen. Korak, when he's upset, he could have rightly reasoned to himself, Hark, I'm upset. I'm bothered by this. I should go to Moshe and sit down and talk about this. Maybe I should have Moshe and Mrs. Moshe over for dinner. And so I brought you here to break bread with you, to have this meal with you, and I want to share my heart with you. I'm offended. I'm offended because Elizabeth got the position that I think I should have had. Can you help me to understand what's going on? Why would God make that decision? Moshe might not have known. He said, you know what? That's a good question, cousin Court. I'll go ask him and find out. 15,000 people did not have to die. But Cork wouldn't leave it alone. He started digging on it. And instead of going and talking to Moshe, he will act it out in his offense and he refused to be reconciled. Listen, his perceived offense was greater than reason. Think about that. When your offense prevents you from rightly reasoning and contemplating things out without a heap of emotions, you're in a dangerous place. <laughs> he rather chose to walk among the offended looking for troops and allies to rally a mob to stand against Moshe. If I get enough people that believe like I do, will be right. Numbers do not make you right. Rabbi Ari Khan said this, just as the spies were great leaders, so was Korah. He was not a marginal character. After all, according to Ari Khan, he was one of those responsible for carrying the ark. He said, our sages said Korak was exceedingly wise and he was among the carriers of the ark. Can you imagine being one of the privileged four men of Israel that it is your job as a Levite to go and to pick up the staff that is on the ark and lift it up to your shoulders and carry the very presence of Yah through the camp? If that was indeed the case, would you not think, well, you know what? That's not a small job. So I'm not the prince. I'm carrying the ark. Korak's role, according to Rabbi Ginsburg, he said, or Ari Khan continued, he says, his role in carrying the art means that he was a lower dimensional representation of the roles of the Caravine, the living creatures who make up Yah's throne. The Caravim are extremely lofty angels, and in the book of Revelation, uh, described in Ezekiel and Revelation, the roles of the Koinim below are akin to angels above who are ministering in the heavenly temple. In other words, these exalted messengers who are Yah's throne in the heavens are depicted by human beings on the earth. He is vitally connected to an exalted angel. And he can't see his own lofty place. 
Yitzhak Ginsburg describes Korak as saying, like Moshe Rabino, he was a Levite, a Levite and a well-respected leader in his tribe. Indeed, he too possessed a very great and lofty soul, and his popularity among the people misguided him, caused him to dispute Moshe and his brother Aaron's divinely appointed leadership. Who does this sound like? you got a great, high, and lofty position, but you want something higher, and it costs you everything. Who? Hasatan. Consider that recent events also led to feelings of disgruntlement in the camp. The same generation that had left Mitzrayim and crossed the sea on dry ground and heard God's voice at Mount Sinai and they were eating manna on a daily basis and drinking water supernaturally from a rock that are warmed at night by the pillar of fire and cooled in the day by a cloud whose clothes are not wearing out and whose shoes are not wearing out, whose feet are not swelling for all the walking that they're doing, are now told you are going to die in the wilderness. You've come a long way. You built the tabernacle and God's presence filled it. But you, now you're going to die in the wilderness. You're not going to go to the promised land. You're not going to live in houses that you didn't build. You're not going to have fields and vineyards that you didn't plant because of your unbelief. Rather than look in the mirror and say, you're a fool because you didn't believe and now you lost everything. But what did they say? Moshe lied. Moshe lied to us. He brought us out here knowing that we would die in this wilderness. He never intended to take us into the promised land. It's all been a cruel joke and it's all Moshe's fault. They might also said, Yahweh's judgment on us is not fair. It's not fair. We only messed up a little bit. Maybe they surmised, Yah has abandoned us. He brought us out here, showed us who he was, and now he's gone home and left us here. There's no milk, no honey, no homes, no vineyards. There's nothing. Similar to what Kepha, Peter writes about in 2 Kepha, chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that mockers shall come in the last days with mocking, walking according to their own lust, and say, where is the promise of his coming? Where is it at? I don't know the day of his return, but I know it's closer now than what it has been. And we pray that it happens quickly because I don't want to see the world continue to spiral in the direction that it's currently going. Also know this. The spirit of bitterness is contagious. Y'all say that from experience? The spirit of bitterness is contagious. Hebrews 12 verse 15. See to it that no one falls short of the favor of Elohim, that no root of bitterness springing up cause trouble by which many how many? Many become defiled. Your bitterness, your anger, your animosity, your, your spoiled spirit is contagious. It rubs off on people. I was thinking about this laying in bed last night and why it came to me, I don't know. But the cup of wine that is used in, in a wedding and both the, the bride and the bridegroom drink of the cup, normally what is said, when sorrows are shared between the couple, they are halved. 
But when joy is shared, the joy is doubled. Isn't that pretty? Yeah. When you have a cup of bitterness and you start drinking out of it and you're offering it to everyone around, it's it gets down. It don't take but a sip. Don't take but a little bit. And like the serpent in the garden, you get people's minds turning and flipping and flopping and they start doubting and they start getting their bitterness going. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to 16. You would sure one, but beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are savage wolves. By their fruit you shall know them. What determines the fruit? The root. The root of the tree is the identity of the tree. The root of the olive tree is the patriarchs. The olive tree of Israel is rooted in that covenant that was given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And the complete trust that they walked in. And it has produced good fruit. Matter of fact, you can take bad limbs off of a wild olive tree and graft them in to the olive tree of the patriarchs and they'll start producing fruit after those men and not after the wild nature of man. When men are walking in deception, Yeshua says, look at the fruit. Watch what they're doing. Where they walk, where they speak, where they go, where they began to flow. Are people blessed and encouraged and edified? And are they growing and are they upbuilded? Are they quoting the word? Are they living in joy? Or are they, all, are they always mad about something? Confession. House of David, originally we came out mad and angry about stuff that we were dissatisfied with and upset about. And we spent about a year or two years being mad about stuff. But there was no joy in being angry. After we figured out whether Skittles were kosher or not, we, we needed to decide whether we're going to be happy about that or not. We finally repented for the last time of having pepperoni on our pizza. And we said, that's it. We're not going to do that anymore. That was the last thing for to go for me. I had to have pepperoni. And I was praying right over about where Brian is sitting, right over here in this building. And I heard that clear, unmistakable voice say to me, son, you've been angry long enough and it's taking you as far as it's going to take you. You need to figure out what you're happy and joyful about. The Torah is about joy. The expectations and the anticipation of the fruit of the Torah should be joyful to us. It's not a drudgery. It's not a heavy weight hanging around our neck. It's not legalism. It's not bondage. It's life. And if you're not walking in the life of his word, mm. we're missing the point. All right. All right. Yes, bad things are happening. Yes, things are not to our satisfaction. Yes, evil men are succeeding. But the kingdom is coming. That's right. That's right. We know that the world's going to do what the world's going to do. That's but right. Yah's going to do what he's going to do. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. I can get upset about all that's around me or I can be joyful about what I'm expecting. Right now. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be happy than mad. Yes, indeed. I feel a whole lot better. That's right. I want to read something to you. I uh, was able to secure this commentary. Uh, the Treasures of Aaron, which is a Torah commentary. Considering what Korak might have been talking about around the campfires. 
It says, our sages went to great lengths in mentioning the words of mockery that Korak had fabricated with his imagination in order to recount as follows. Korak gathered the whole assembly against him. He began to say derisive statements and told them, there was a certain widow in my neighborhood with two orphan daughters. She had a single field. She came to plow and Moshe said to her, from Deverine 22.10, you should not plow with an ox and a donkey together. She came to plant. Well, she said to her, you should not plant your field and mix seed. She came to harvest and to make a pile. And he said to her, leave over gleanings, forgotten sheaves, and produce of the corner. She came to make it into a pile of finished produce. And he said to her, give Teremah approximately 2% to the priest. Teramas Maasur, a tithe of the tithe given by the priest to the priest. And Maasur Rishon, the first tithe given to the Levite. And another second tithe given to the, by the owner in Jerusalem. She justified the rightness of the judgment she gave him. What did she do? She sold the field and bought two sheep to clothe herself with their shearings and to derive benefit from their offspring. When they gave birth, Aaron came and said to her, Give me the firstborn, for thus did the Holy One bless me. He said to me, All the firstborn males that are born in your cattle and in your flock, you shall sanctify to Hashem your God. She justified the rightness of the judgment she gave him. The time of shearing arrived, and she sheared them. He said to her, Give me the first shearing, for thus did the Holy One bless me. He said to me, And the first shearing of your flock shall you give him. She said, I have no strength to withstand this man. Behold, I will slaughter them and eat them. When she slaughtered them, he said to her, Give me the foreleg, the jaw, and the stomach. She said to him, Even though I have slaughtered them, I am not saved from his hand. Behold, they are segregated property to me. He said to her, Give me them. For thus says Scripture, Every segregated property in Israel shall be yours. And he took them and went away. He left her and her two daughters crying. Now, according to that thought, Korah twisted the Torah to say that it is against everybody, that you can't win. Yah didn't give this Torah to Moshe. He came down off the mount and it was imagine it in himself and he was saying everybody's holy Moshe we all are to be able to get the Torah for ourselves can you imagine what would happen and the confusion that would come to the body of Messiah if everybody was able to declare their own doctrine and everybody's doctrine was equally true well the Lord told me the spirit gave this to me I saw this in a vision. None of our words from him would be authoritative because all of our words would be one against the other. The root determines the fruit. If you're mad about the Torah, you're not going to walk in the joy of the Torah and you're not going to teach anyone else to do it either. So when people come to you expressing their feelings, their insights, and asking about yours, here's your question. What are they getting at? Do they have an agenda? More often than not, when people come and they share and they converse, they're legitimate. They're just talking. They're just sharing their thoughts. But there are those moments, not all the time, not even most of the time, but every once in a while, your spirit will raise up an alarm. Not your spirit, but the Ruach will raise up an alarm within you. More often than not, that's when Laura says something's not right. I see red flags waving. I feel ill at ease. What is that? It's the Ruach saying, you need to look deeper here. That's when it's not conversation, but a leading or a persuading. 
It's a poll taking. It's a pulsing of others when someone is looking for allies to assist them in their cause. And again, most of the time, we talk, we share, we dream, we plan, we seek, we try to figure out how to do things and what we need to do. Sometimes, sometimes, and you'll see them on videos and in their books and in, on the radio, etc. What are they doing? They're promoting an agenda, looking for allies. How do we know the difference? Their fruit. How are people who walk with them, how are they living? Are they joyful or happy? Are they a part of the body? Are they integrated? Are they functioning? Are they fruit bearing? Or are they unhappy and angry and upset and striving and filled with strife? Don't pick the wrong fruit. Now why even go here? It's in the word, it's in the Torah, and it happens all the time. The body of Messiah is oftentimes fractured and divided because there are those who are like wolves in sheep's clothing. That means they look like sheep, right? No. Who wears clothing made out of sheep skins? The shepherd. The shepherd's clothes are made from the wool that he brings from the sheep. Thank you, Mike Clayton. Give me credit this time. They come looking like shepherds, but they're wolves. I'm going to leave that there. The second part of this is to engage the ritual. And this is where this started. I I kept thinking about the fire pan, the danger of the fire pan. This is a required act of priestly ritual. And the end result of it could be beneficial or disastrous. Remember Nadav and Abihu, what happened to them? They came before Yah with their fire pans with incense on it, with smoke going up. Yah's fire shot out of the Mishkan and consumed them in a moment. Why? They broke his protocol. Yah says it was strange fire. It's an offering that I did not ask for. It's not something that I desired, and you did it anyway. It was freelance worship according to your own heart. They died. Now, did Moshe know that Korak and these 250 men with him would be consumed in Yah's fire? He specifically told them, do what Nadav and Abihu did. Get you a fire pan and bring incense before the door of Yah's house. Did he know that they would die? Or was this a dare to them hoping that they would back down and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm not doing that. What did they choose to do? They went and got their fire pans. The Talmud says this, and I found this really interesting, that it suggests that the, the, the manna that was like a coriander seed falling onto the ground with the dew every morning. It says in the book of Exodus 16 and 4 that the people had to go out to gather it. And they translated in the Torah, uh, the Talmud is saying they had to go outside the camp to gather it. In other words, it did, they didn't just walk out of the door of their tent and boom, there it was. They had to go find it. Some had to go a great distance to find it, while those that were more righteous, it was close to their tent. What did, God, what did Moshe say? In the morning, come. That is, after you've had to go out and gather the manna. Perhaps the Talmud is suggesting is 
that the further they had to go to get their manna, it should have dawned on them. Maybe I'm not as righteous as I think I am. And maybe I need to reconsider this. Let me tell you that in the coming days where judgment falls upon the earth, there will be opportunities for us to examine ourselves. There will be clues given to where we might want to get a clue. We don't want to walk an assumption. Well, I think I've prayed enough. I think I've studied enough. I think I'm righteous enough. I think I do enough. I think I worship enough. I think I'm good enough. If righteousness and its fruit is not very obvious to us, we might want to examine our lives. It's not to say we won't be tried or tested or endure hardships or persevere, have to persevere, but we should understand and know our own spirit. The word says if we will judge ourselves, we won't have to be judged. So by making this contest, quote unquote, in the morning, Maybe he was trying to help these men get a clue. Now, a fire pan is very similar to what we would call a shovel. It had an extended handle. And then it had a pan, oftentimes with a cover on it, that would contain live coals. That you could pick up coals, put them in there with another shovel, and then transfer it from one location to the other. <clears throat> one rabbi says that the three metals that were used in the construction of the Mishkan was gold, silver, and brass. Gold symbolizes the fear of heaven. Silver, the love of Yah. And brass, strength of character. Brass, he says, always indicates strength and power. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1 and verse 18, Yah says, Behold, I have made you today as a fortified city, an iron pillar, and walls of brass against the whole land. That is, your character is strong and fortifying of you. But then he says in Isaiah 48 and 4, For I know that you are obdurate, your neck is like an iron sinew, and your forehead brass. The same quality of you being resolute and strong and standing can be either standing for good or standing arrogantly. Brass can either indicate that you're walking righteously and upright or that you are proud and obstinate. So when they brought, it says that they brought brass fire pans. What's going on? Their character is being judged. Are they righteous men or flesh-driven men? They're about to be proven. They had to have live coals. Where are they going to get the live coals from? Only the Kohanim can go to the altar of sacrifice and get coals from that altar to bring before Yah. They're not Kohanim. Where are they going to get it? Their own campfire, perhaps. Only the high priest, Aaron, had access to the prescribed formula of incense that Yah says is pleasant to me. Now, what they offered very well may have smelled nice to human nostrils, but how does it smell to him? So, 251 men, those 250 leaders in Korak, come with their brass fire pans. Coals from their own campfires, perhaps, and incense of their own choosing. Only one stands before Yah with the fire pan of the right kind of coals and the right kind of incense. It's called being legitimate or being illegitimate. Remember, calling, they were calling Moshe's Torah into question. If they don't believe that Moshe received this Torah from Yah, then the recipe for the incense didn't matter. The location and source of the coals didn't matter. Because Moshe must have just made all that up to elevate Aaron and not them. 
you don't believe this word, you're going to do what is right in your own eyes. How often is that worked out? From the time of the garden throughout the annals of the history of Israel, every time that it says, and each man did what was right in his own eyes, there is disaster. When you don't declare righteous word and doctrine, people are left to devise their own understanding of truth and do what is right in their own eyes. And we have raised up multitudes internationally to walk according to their own wisdom and their own understanding and they're in a dangerous place. Let's go to the book of 1 John. Now let's think about this. The altar of sacrifice declared the right identity of Yeshua as the Messiah. It declared his effectual work in our behalf. Every one of those offerings laid on that described who Messiah is. If you come offering that which comes from a different identity, the Messiah of your own preferences, your fire is not accepted. What is it? You're coming before Yah, promoting the cause of the, what we call the Antichrist or the Anti-Messiah. In 1st Yochanan chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Anti-Messiah is coming, even now many Anti-Messiahs have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. Verse 22. Who is the liar except the one denying that Yeshua is the Messiah? This is the anti-Messiah, the one denying the Father and the Son. In chapter 4, verse number 3. And every spirit that does not confess that Yeshua Messiah has come in the flesh is not of Elohim, and this is the spirit of the anti-Messiah which you heard is coming and now is already in the world. This is not a new thing. It's been around for a couple thousand or more years. Second Yochanan, just turn the page. Chapter 1, verse 7. Because many who are leading astray went out into the world who did not confess Yeshua Messiah as coming in the flesh. This one is he who is leading astray and the anti-Messiah. The word anti there also is, understand, as pseudo. He's not just one who stands against Yeshua, but one who presents himself instead of or as another version of Yeshua. Coming before him and offering to him our own incense and our own coals to present before him the fire pan ministry of worship and adoration and intimacy with him is to come with a different Yeshua and not be accepted. Yeshua saw two men praying. One a Pharisee, one a tax collector. The Pharisees, I thank you that I, I'm not like the rest of men. Boy, what a statement. I'm not like everybody else. I'm not a swindler. I'm not unrighteous. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not like this tax collector. The tax collector is saying, well, Elohim, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Have mercy. Yeshua said the tax collector went home justified not the Pharisee. And it wasn't the, the title of Pharisee or the position of Pharisee. It was the arrogance of his heart. What was he doing? Offering up strange incense that Yah was not willing to receive. Here's something else that they don't know me. Dathan, Aviram, On, the son of Peleth, and Korah. They had it in their mind. We're going to overthrow the current leadership. 
We're going to change things. We're not happy with how things are going. And we've been overlooked. Now, I don't say this derogatorily here. This is not a blanket statement on anyone. But was it possible that their wives were encouraging it to them? You're right, honey. You've been wrong. If anybody is going to protect my back, Laura's going to protect mine. When I refuse to acknowledge a, a, an insult or a, a, a problem or a wayward thing, Laura is, man, she's mama bear. She's watching. She's, I don't like what the, I don't like that. I don't, I, you should have, you should be, except she promotes me. And I thank her for that. There are times that she will say, it, it's just not right. And I was like, I'm not worried about it. It'll be all right. No, it's just not right. <laughs> I'm wondering if their wives behind the scenes were pushing them. And why would I even say that? Because when the earth opened up and swallowed in judgment, it took their wives down as well as the husbands. Ladies, if your husband's not walking right, don't follow him. That's all I need to say. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Red, um, this morning about um, the rabbis say that exact same thing, that one of them that initially was with the group of men that came up against Aaron, um, Aaron and Moses was not included later on. And so the rabbis say, that his wife went to him and said, if Moses isn't the right one, God will work it out. And if if Korak is wrong is right, he will be elevated and will still leave you behind because he's all about himself. And so he <laughs> never <laughs> <laughs> So he wasn't he backed off and he wasn't included in Was that movie. own son of Pella? I can't remember. Because he, he doesn't seem to show up later. No, it was that it was him, yes. So his, the, the rabbis give her the credit that she spoke wisdom into him and that Korach's wife was the one that was encouraging him, telling him. Guys, also, when your wife looks at you and says, you need to back down, you're acting in pride. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You're out of place. Yes, honey. Yes, dear. Your attitude stinks. <laughs> yep. Tell her, say, well, I'll at least go pray about it. You don't have to tell her that she's right right then. But I mean, you need to go back to the Lord. Come back and say, you know, I prayed about it, and the Father said that he told you to tell me that. <laughs> okay. Last thoughts. Embracing the resolve. Before you can get out of this chapter, the earth has opened up and swallowed families. And the masses of the Israel's heard these people's screams as they're going down into the bowels of the earth, and the earth just covers right over top of them, and they're gone. They're gone. Fire has shot out of the Mishkan, and 251 men are instantly consumed. And there stands Aaron with his fire pan, unsinged and unscorched. It's obvious that Yah has got this. The next day, the next day, everybody shows up in front of Aaron and Moshe and says, you kill the righteous people. Now, to give them a little bit of credibility in their statement, perhaps that they were the ones raised in the pagan society of Mitzrayim where demonic sorcery and magic happened on a regular basis. And perhaps they thought that Moshe was the greatest of magicians and a phenomenal sorcerer and that he's the one that was doing all this stuff. But they knew better. They had to know better. A plague breaks out and people are dropping by the thousands. 
Moshe and Aaron are laying on their face. Both of them. And Moshe turns his face toward Aaron and out of the side of his mouth says, get your fire pan and go stand between the living and the dead. And Aaron says, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> you ain't do what? Get your fire pan, put coals and incense on it and go stand in front of the, the living between them and the dead. Go stop the plague. Aaron does it. He gets up, gets the fire pan with incense and coals and stands in front of the wall of the plague where people are dying and it comes to the smoke of his fire pan intercession and the plague stops. On one side, there's 14,700 people laying on the ground dead. And on this side, people are alive. It was coming like a tidal wave. Yah was more than a little upset. The fire pan ministry is intimate worship. It's intimate praise. It's intercession. It's deep groanings and wailings before Yah for the sins of the people. And can I tell you, as Johnny was talking about the sins of this nation, the only reason that America still stands as a nation is because of the prayers of this and previous generations. We may not understand it, but we're benefactors of grandma, grandpa, and their previous generations' prayers and intercessions. They cried out for revival. They prayed against the sins of the war of the uh, the Moors, the social Moors of their day, not realizing that they apply to our own day as well. Are we praying enough for our children and grandchildren to survive? Or are we just basking in the glows of previous generations' intercession? Somebody ought to get to praying. Because yeah. if we don't, and Yeshua tarries, my children and grandchildren will not have the benefit of prayer and its covering. They need to hear us, Brian. Our kids, our grandkids. I grew up listening to mom and daddy pray. My daddy taught me how to pray. The men of the church that I grew up in taught me how to pray. I, I agree. Was this week with the kids before bed, they were on the bed in a circle holding hands as we either read a book and or had a Bible story. And they joined hands and I said, y'all would like to pray. And now's the time. I'm let you pray before God prays. And it blessed my heart so much to hear their little voices. Of course, one of the main things that they praise the Father for was that they could be together. They loved one another so much and every one of them said, thank you, Father, we can be together but we want this house to play and have a good time. And that blessed me so much. Of course, I was crying each time they prayed. But their hearts are so sincere and they're just waiting. They're waiting for us to teach them. They're waiting for us to spend that time with them. You know, and then steal the word and his promises in them. Maybe not. Maybe not so much more than that. Yah says in chapter 17, verse 5. And it shall be that the rod of the man whom I choose buds, and I shall rid myself of the grumblings of the children of Israel, which they grumble against you. When you stand against Moshe, when you stand against the Torah that God gave to him, you're standing against him, against Yah. And Yah says, I'm sick of your grumbling. And I want to settle this once and for all. Each tribal prince was to bring their rod with their name inscribed upon it, give it to Moshe, who is going to leave it in the presence of Yah and the Mishkan overnight. The next morning when they went in, Aaron's rod had budded, blossomed, 
and produced almonds. Past, present, and future. The rest of them was just a stick. Without a stick, a rod that is cut off from the root and does not have leaves, it's just a remembrance of what it used to be in the life that it used to have. But when your place of authority is bearing fruit and giving life, there's power in it. A lot of leaders just carry a stick. Yahs wanted a man of Elohim, a woman of the Most High that will stand in authority and have fruit in their lives. The Jewish Encyclopedia says that Aaron's rod was placed and concealed with the Ark of the Covenant. And its whereabouts will remain unknown until in the Messianic age, the prophet Elijah shall reveal it to them. <laughs> According to the Midrash, that staff, that rod is going to come back and it's going to be found in the hands of King Messiah. It says, and the staff of Aaron, that same staff was held in the hand of every king until the temple was destroyed. And then it was divinely hidden away. That same staff also is destined to be held in the hand of the King Messiah. May it be speedily in our day. As it says, the staff of your strength, the Lord will send out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. From Psalms 110 verse 2. Why almonds? Almonds is the word shakid. In the book of Jeremiah, verse uh, chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. And the word of Yahweh came to me saying, what do you see, Yahu? And he said, I said, I see a branch of a chikid, an almond tree. And Yahweh said to me, you have seen well, for I am, our translation says, watching or hastening, shokid. It's a play on words, shakid, shokid. For I am watching over my word to do it. The almond tree is a symbol of prophecy. It's the first tree to awaken in the spring from winter sleep. And my understanding is the last then to produce the almonds. So it awakens and blossoms and has leaves early indicating something's coming, something's coming, something's coming. But you have to wait until the end to see the fruit of it. So it's talking about resurrection. Yeshua, like the almond tree, is the first fruits of the resurrection. I want to remind you today, and this is important as I close. First closing. Yeshua is not dead. He's alive. Many years ago, we had some folks, two or three, left our congregation, went to Israel, fell among anti-missionaries, and came back speaking against Yeshua. And wanted me to do the same. They wanted me to deny Yeshua as the Messiah. And take this congregation into, basically, into full-on Judaism. And that room right there was my office at the time. I sat with them and we discussed some things. And I asked the one that was the most vocal. And I said, I need to ask you a question. Yeshua of Nazareth, is he dead or alive? I knew that they had prayed in his name. I knew that they had worshipped him. I knew that they had encountered him in the past. And somehow intellectually they had been argued out of their reason to accept him. Her answer to me was, I don't know. I said, then I can't help you until you can come to the answer of that question. But I ask you this, if he's dead, if he's alive, why is he alive and Moshe and David and all the other prophets, why are they still in their tomb? He 
He's alive because he's changed me. It's not just his historical character. Amen. Yeshua said this in Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news, the gospel to every creature. It's important for us to understand this. A gospel or a message that tells people to feel better, how to get over their problems, how to have a better marriage, how to reorder their finances. Those are good things, but they're not going to change the heart of the person. You can change the mechanics of your walk and your being, your doing, and not change the inside of who you are. But the most meaningful change that can happen to a person is when they are reborn on the inside. And self-help is not going to do that. There has to be the gospel. I give credit to Al Carpenter and Brian's grandfather. He looked at me a couple of days ago and he says, we need to get back to preaching the gospel. Yeshua said in Luke 14, 4, 18, excuse me, <coughs> quoting Isaiah concerning himself, he said, the spirit of Yahweh is upon me because he has anointed me to bring the good news, the gospel to the poor. What were we taught is the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. But let's look at what the word says. And Mark 1, verse 14 and 15. And after Yochanan, that is Yochanan the Baptist, was delivered up, Yeshua came to Galil proclaiming the good news of the reign of Elohim and saying the time has been filled and the reign of Elohim has come near. Like Johnny said earlier, repent and believe in the good news. What is the good news? The reign of Elohim, the kingdom of heaven yeah. is coming close. Yeah. In Matthew 4, verse 23. Yeshua went about all Galil teaching in their congregations, proclaiming the good news of the rain, healing every disease and every bodily weakness among the people. Do you know that when you proclaim the coming of the kingdom, there's power to heal included in that message? In Matthew 24, verse 14, and this good news of the rain not of his death, burial, and resurrection, of the rain shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. In Luke 9, verse 1 and 2, having called his 12 taught ones together, he gave them power and authority over all demons and to heal diseases, and he sent them to proclaim the reign of Elohim. Mm -hmm. And to heal the sick and going out, they went through the villages, bringing the good news or the gospel and healing everywhere. Yeshua had not died yet. He had not been buried yet. He had not been resurrected yet. That's not what they preached because they didn't even believe it when it happened. If they had been preaching it all along, they would not have doubted. But they had problems understanding what had happened when those things took place. That was not what they were preaching. That's right. They were preaching the kingdom of heaven is right here, right now, right in front of us. You need to repent and get ready for it. <clears throat> so what is the gospel? Zechariah 14, verse 9. That's your gospel. Yahweh shall be sovereign over all of the earth. In that day there shall be one yud hey vav hey, and his name one. It's the restoration of all things. We have been given this ministry of reconciliation to bring people to that understanding. Did they need to know that Yeshua died, was buried, and is risen again? Yes. There's power in it. But the reason he died, the reason he was buried, and the reason he was resurrected is to bring you and I the kingdom. Yes. 
The kingdom is coming. And we don't have to wait for Yeshua to appear in the sky to understand the power of the kingdom. It's in here. It's already there. It's love and joy in the Ruach Kodesh. It's peace in the Ruach. Yes. It's in here. Yes. Folks, the world can do what the world's going to do. And you can hear all the reports of all that is upsetting to everyone around you. What are they going to do? They're going to preach about a kingdom or a reign that needs to change hands or be whatever evolved. You're not going to elect an answer for this nation or any other nation in the earth. Because man cannot fix and lead us out of this. We may have seasons of change and improvement here and there, but ultimately man is self-destructive. What do we need? A redeemer, a deliverer. Yes. You are of a kingdom that is yet to come. You have a hope that the world does not have. You have a future that they do not share unless they are willing to accept it. Share it. Give the kingdom away. Go preach the kingdom. Go declare the kingdom. There's healing. There's deliverance. There's demonic uh, uh, power over demons in that. Go walk in it. The roots being exposed. Embrace the ritual of prayers and intercessions and then demonstrate, if you will, the resolve, the kingdom. Let it be so. Okay. Your thoughts or questions to add to this? Were the, were the, the branches that they, uh, each, each tribe, uh, Names, were they all the same tree? We're not told. I, it would probably been whatever tree that they had chosen. Yeah. I have a staff in my office. It's myrtle. Someone gave it to me from a myrtle tree. Um, the staff that uh, the Aaron had obviously was almonds, but I mean it could have been acacia wood or terebinth tree or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Jewish legend says that Yahweh gave that rod to Adam, who gave it to Noah, who gave it to Abraham and to his subsequent sons who ended up in the hands of Yosef. And that um, Yitro, Jethro, saw it and took it and hid it after Yosef's death, and Moshe picked it up. Um, and when he did, that he declared, you're going to be the deliverer of Israel. And that's how it got back to, to Mitzrayim to be used in the plagues. Again, that's Jewish legend. Yeah, typically a shepherd would carve into his staff the symbols or significant happening so it's like his testimony was in in the rod that he carried in his hand when he said they put, they put the rods in the tabernacle they didn't come behind the veil but in the front right probably before the veil I would assume as close as they could get so they would have been like a signet ring family signet ring then a tribe yeah similar Can you imagine what was going on in those men's minds as they stood before the door of the tabernacle the next morning and they brought the rods out and they realized most of them, my rods are dead. <laughs> Nothing happened. But there's Aaron's rod. It's got branches and leaves and fruit and blossoms on it. Wow. Wow. Yah says, by this, I'm going to stop the grumbling. Did it stop the grumbling? Yeah. So are we claiming there was posturing between all of the tribes all the time, or were there people who 
probably the least, but there should not have anything happen to this. I mean, I think ultimately we have our own characteristics and personality traits, and we divided the tribes the way that we saw fit, regardless of what they themselves wanted. I think that some of them were probably content <clears throat> doing exactly what they were doing because that's what they were meant to do. Yeah, I'm sure that there were probably some of these uh, 12 men who were relieved that it's not me. I'd rather rather Aaron have that. I got my own thing to do. Uh, but the tribal rivalries, when you read the stories through Yehoshua uh, and Judges and uh, books of Samuel and Kings, they continued on. And to this day, there is the house of Yehuda versus the house of Yosef or Ephraim is still butting heads. Only in the day of return of Messiah will we see a resolve. In regard to Korak, I'm reminded of the mindset that Yah doesn't always choose the qualified. He qualifies the chosen. Moshe made a statement, Joyce. He says, and who's Aaron that you're upset about him? I can think of Aaron looking and saying, gee, thanks a lot, bro. Yeah. <laughs> but he said, well, who is he? He was chosen. Under Aaron's leadership, that Mishkan was functioning the way it was supposed to. He had already suffered the loss of his two oldest sons in the fire of Yah and kept on doing it. What's also interesting is this Korach's sons show up in the Psalms. Evidently, his sons did not go along with daddy. They repented and their descendants, they ended up being among the, the worshipers in Israel. I'll leave you with this and then we'll pray. I read another piece of commentary out of this, this book that says behind every great man there's a basket of reptiles. <laughs> that is that in every great man's past there are those that were like serpents and reptiles that he had to overcome their stigma and their reputation and their, their influence that Korach looked down prophetically in his line and saw that Samuel was his descendant and thought to himself, I must be a really great man to produce a descendant like Samuel, who in many ways is equal to Moshe, not realizing that he himself was the basket of reptiles that Samuel had to overcome. I thought that was interesting. Let's stand. Will you receive the blessing of his name? Yivareka ka Yahweh vayishmareka Yae Yahweh panavileka Vekoneka Yisa Yahweh panavileka we ask Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious and favorable to you. And may Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and he may grant unto you Shalom. Let's face Jerusalem. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, 
Yahweh Echad Baruch Shem Kavod Mahuto Le'alam Va'ed Baruch Atah Yahweh Eloheinu Malech Wa'alam Hamotze Lecha Min Ha'ares Blessed are you, Yahweh our God, King of this universe, who has brought forth bread from the earth. In the name of your Son, Yeshua HaMashiach is our brother, Father, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. Amen.